Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll listen in again on Jesus' conversation with his disciples in Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And, but, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. This is the word of our Lord. Jesus promises that the gates of Hades will not overcome his church. There's a warning implicit in that promise. The gates of Hades will try. Jesus paints a picture of the devil mustering his forces of evil at the gates of hell, or getting ready to unleash them against God's church. And also implicit in, in that promise is that at least at times, it will appear as though the devil has won. If it would never appear as though evil had the upper hand against God's church, there wouldn't have been any reason for Jesus to make the promise. So there's a lot packed into that, that phrase, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The devil is going to, to let loose against God's church, and there will be times when it looks like he's killed it. Our minds might go to scandals. The pastor becomes clear that the pastor is no longer the person that he played on Sunday mornings. You've seen it happen. Such scandals, they, they, they break people's faith and they tear congregations apart. Or your mind might go to, to false teaching. Churches where Jesus is preached as some sort of, of, of slave driver who cares only about rules and not about people. Or, or churches where, where Jesus is preached only as some sort of like life coach whose only thing he can offer you is a, is a recipe for a happier work week. Churches where, where all that remains is, is this hollowed out name of Jesus, but, but not his salvation. But if we keep in mind what the church is, we see that the devil's attacks strike even closer to home than that. The church is people. The devil's end game isn't to take institutions away from Jesus. It's to take people. And when we keep that in mind, we can see that his attacks strike even closer to home than the others. The devil brings the battle to, to moms and dads and kids and young men and women and grandmas and grandpas. As long as they're Christian, the devil is going to do everything in his power to change that. He worms his way into souls and plants seeds of sin. Sins that, 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 that seem so small that the Christian concludes, ah, what's it going to hurt? And then the devil waits patiently for that seed of sin to blossom into unbelief. He climbs into calendars and schedules, filling them up until the Christian no longer has time for Christ. He puffs up hearts with a false sense of security, convincing Christians that, oh, I, I'll, I'll never fall away from Jesus no matter how much I stay away from Jesus. And it works. I think we can all think of times where the devil has succeeded. Even people who have, who have stood in this room with us and confessed, I believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus. 
but they no longer do. After all, Jesus' promise isn't, isn't a promise that, that no Christian will ever fall away. His promise is, is rather, however many Christians fall away, God will always preserve a remnant of Christians. That, that as long as this earth endures, there will always be people on it who believe in Jesus. By showing us how he does that, God also shows us how he does it for us. And when he does that, he, he takes away a, a false sense of security that we might have on the one side and, and, and fear on the other side, and, and he replaces them with a right-minded trust that when you stand with Jesus, you stand secure. He does that by letting us in on a conversation between, between Jesus and his disciples. So this, this took place more than two years into Jesus' public ministry. By now, Jesus was a household name. But even though so many people, they, they knew about Jesus and had heard stuff, but they, they still weren't, weren't right on, they still weren't sure about who Jesus was and, and what exactly he came to do. For example, some people thought that maybe Jesus was John the Baptist. John the Baptist had, had lost his head by this point. So they were thinking, well, well, well maybe Jesus is John come back from the dead. Or, or maybe he's Elijah. Elijah was the Old Testament prophet who went to heaven without dying, so maybe Jesus is Elijah come back down to earth. Or, or maybe Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And true to form, Peter answers for the bunch, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ was, was Old Testament talk for Savior. Messiah, it was in, in Hebrew. Peter's answer was, Jesus, I, we know that you're, you're, you're not just a guy that speaks for God. You're not just a prophet. You're a savior. You, you are God. And Jesus responds to Peter, Peter, that you know that, that's not something that you came up with by yourself. That you know who I am. That's God's work in you. And that confession, Jesus goes on to say, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's, that's the rock on which I will build my church. And, and no matter what the devil throws against it, that church will endure. So the, Jesus says that the foundation of the Christian church is the confession that, that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is Savior. And when God's people stand on that rock, they stand secure, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. It's the kind of thing that, that sweeps any arrogance out of the Christian's heart. That I believe that Jesus is my Savior. Something that seems so easy. That's not something that comes naturally to me. That's God's work in me. God has opened up my eyes to see it and my heart to believe it. We can, we can look out on, on a sizable chunk of our population that, that doesn't give two hoots about who Jesus is. And their minds are too busy with reality to concern themselves with fiction. And, and we can look at them and, and, and wonder, why don't they get it? And we can, we can look at a significant percentage of, of churches where, where all that remains of Jesus is, is a, a hollowed out name, where he's a, a preached as a slave driver or as a life coach, but there's, there's nothing about restor, the restoration of a fallen humanity with a righteous God. And we can wonder, why don't they get it? And that, that bewilderment over why they don't get it, be careful with that. Because that can transform into, 
into a false security that presumes that, well, I'll always get it. That it doesn't make any, any difference how I prioritize my schedule, how often I receive the Lord's Supper, whether I come to Bible class or bring my kids to Sunday school. Don't worry about us. We'll always be Christians. False security that presumes that it doesn't make any difference whether I fight against temptation or just give into it because I can stop whenever I want to. And that false security that presumes that I'll, that I'll always stay with Jesus, even if I stay away from him, that, that my faith is some innate quality that I'll never lose. You know what that does? that lures me away from the rock on which God's people stand secure. That's faith in myself. But I'm not the Christ. Jesus is my Savior. So why would Jesus tell his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ? Doesn't that seem strange? He calls Peter blessed to know it, and he says that it's the, the foundation on which he will build his church. And then he warns his disciples not to tell anyone. It helps to understand that this wasn't a permanent prohibition. Before Jesus would, would broadly reveal himself to the world as God's promised Savior, Jesus wanted to, to show the world what kind of Savior God promised. That it wasn't, that it wasn't just about, about miracles and making people's lives on earth better. El Elijah performed miracles, some pretty spectacular ones, but he wasn't the Christ. That it wasn't just about uh, powerful preaching. Jeremiah, John the Baptist, they could, they could deliver a fine sermon, but they weren't the Christ. It was something that was yet to come. It was Jesus' death and resurrection that would make him their Savior. So before Jesus would tell it broadly, he would, he would show it. And this is how he showed it. The Son of the living God dies on the cross he pays the price for the sins of the world with his life. All of God's wrath for every bit of evil in every single person is poured out on him until there's no wrath left to pour out. That's the foundation on which God's church is built. It's, it's a rock that's stained with his own blood. That's what it means that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. First, Jesus would show them, and then he'd tell them. After he rose from the dead, he, he told them through the preaching of Peter and, and, the, other, and the other apostles that, that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is your Savior, Jesus was preached, Jesus was believed, and what happened? A church was built. Not a building, but people. And then after Peter and the other apostles were, were killed and, and joined God's church in heaven, that, that, that preaching was carried on through the, the rest of God's church on earth. Jesus was preached. Jesus was believed. And that church continued to be built. And that building has been going on through the generations all the way down to, to you. That, that proclamation of who Jesus is, that, that he's not some slave driver that cares only about rules and not about people. He's not a life coach whose goal is to make your life as easy as possible on earth. That he's your restoration with a righteous God, 
And as much as the devil has fought against it, and as many predictions as people, uh, that people, as people have made that, oh, Christianity is going to die, the church has endured. There's always been Christians. And as long as this earth endures, that will always be the case, no matter how weak the institution looks, no matter how weak we feel. So can you, can you picture that, 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 that image in your mind of the Christian church, the people that are built on Christ? So if you're imagining that right now, you can, you can identify someone in that picture because you're in it. And on that rock of Christ, you stand secure. It's not because of how strong you are. In fact, you may feel like you're the weakest one of all. It's not because of how strong you are. It's because of where you're standing. It's not because you've sinned less than most. In fact, you may have sinned more than all the rest. It's because you're standing on the one who took away your sins. It's because when, when Jesus made that promise, on this rock I will build my church, he had you in mind. And we continued that promise. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus said that for your sake too. When you stand on Jesus, you stand secure. Amen.